Terrence Hayes is a poet, educator, and a 2014 MacArthur Fellow. His work has appeared in such esteemed publications as Best American Poetry, Poetry Magazine, The American Poetry Review, and many, many more. He's also won multiple Pushcart Prizes and a Whiting Writers Award and received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Guggenheim Foundation. So basically, he's killing the game. Uh, Hayes explores race, gender, and culture in an honest, unflinching way that keeps his readers spellbound but still wanting more. His latest book, American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin, shines a light on racial violence in America and, as is quoted in The New York the New Yorker is a diary of survival during a period when black men are in constant danger. This is one of the deepest accounts I have read in poetry of what it feels like to have one's body fetishized as an object, but criminalized as a force. Please help me welcome Terrence Hayes. All right, y'all. So, um, I've been trying to figure out how to read this thing, really how to read it without breaking into a sweat. Um, so I've tried a bunch of different things and I just had an idea back there for y'all, which was maybe to read some of the poems I kept trying to write or little refrains that show up. So I was like, okay, so that's 20, it might be 21 poems. So we'll be done in like 20 minutes. And then we can talk. I mean, really, um, I mean, I've read the poems, so obviously <laughs> I wrote them too. So that's not what I'm here for. I'm obviously here to talk because I know it's in the book. So whatever y'all want to talk about after that, as long as it's good questions. Uh, we can talk about the news, that's crazy too. Because I was thinking, and then I'm gonna read. And I'm not gonna talk, I'm just gonna read them, but I will say this just from today. Because this stuff overwhelms me, man. That's where these poems come from. I'm just like, I can't think straight because the news is always so disruptive and it leads me into like metaphors. So the first thing I was like, when ever in history, like in the whole history of like leaders in their countries, can you ever remember a motherfucker like talking against his own people to somebody else? Like, isn't that crazy? Think of one example. Not even Hitler was like, yeah, the Germans, <laughs> that my, yeah, my Nazis, I don't know if they're that great. Like, so that's like, how's that even a leader if you're like, so there's that. And then it would be like your dad too. This is a metaphor stuff. Like, you know, if you were in a fight in the yard, and your dad came out, and he took the side of the person who was beating you up. <laughs> so that's where we are. Um, but what I'm gonna do though, because um, sometimes I just wanted to get away from that, right? So I would just write whatever was coming, and then sometimes I would think about it. So anyway, so what I'm gonna do for you is just read them, and then um, we'll talk. American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. The black poet would love to say his century began with Hughes or God forbid Wheatley, but actually it began with all the poetry weirdos and warriors, warriors, poetry whiners and winos falling from ship bows, sunset bridges and windows. In a second, I'll tell you how little writing rescues. My hunch is that Sylvia Plath was not especially fun company. A drama queen, thin-skinned and skittery, she thought her poems were ordinary. What do you call a visionary who does not recognize her vision? Orpheus was alone when he invented writing. His manic drawing became a kind of writing when he sent his beloved a sketch of an eye with an X struck through it. He meant, I am blind without you. She thought he meant, I never want to see you again. It is possible he meant that too. American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. Inside me is a black-eyed animal bracing in a small stall, as if a bird could grow without breaking its shell, as if the clatter of a thousand blackbirds whipping in a storm could be held in a shell. Inside me is a huge black bull balled small enough to fit inside the bead of a nipple ring. I mean to leave a record of my raptures. I was raised by a beautiful man. I loved his grasp of time. 
My mother shaped my grasp of space. Would you rather spend the rest of eternity with your wild wings bewildering a cage or with your four good feet stuck in a plot of dirt? I got these marked in my uh, index, so I got to go back. Let's see here. All right, this is sort of a definition, I guess. I'll say that. How about that? Some chatter between the poems. Um, this one is like a definition. You know, I was trying to feel like I didn't want to be talking to people about what I was trying to do, so I was like, oh, I'll just write a poem. I'll tell you what I'm trying to do. American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. I lock you in an American sonnet that is part prison, part panic closet, a little room in a house set aflame. I lock you in a form that is part music box, part meat grinder, to separate the song of the bird from the bone. I lock your persona in a dream-inducing sleeper hold while your better selves watch from the bleachers. I make you both Jim and Crow here. As the crow, you undergo a beautiful catharsis trapped one night in the shadows of the gym. As the gym, the feel of crow shit dropping to your floors is not unlike the stars falling from the pep rally posters on your walls. I make you a box of darkness with a bird in its heart. Voltas of acoustics, instinct, and metaphor. It is not enough to love you. It is not enough to want you destroyed. American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. Even the most kind-hearted white woman, dragging herself through traffic with her nails on the wheel and her head in a chamber of black modern American music, may begin almost carelessly to breathe inwards. Yes, even the most bespectacled hallucination, cruising the lanes of America, may find her tongue curls inward, entangling her windpipe, her vents, toes, and pedals when she drives alone. Even the most made up layers of persona in a two or four lane vehicle sealed in a fountain of bass and black boys chanting in words may begin to chant inwardly, softly, before she can catch herself. Of course, after that, what is inward is absorbed. American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. But there never was a black male hysteria. Because a fret of white men drove you crazy or a clutch of goons drove you through money, stole your money, paid you money, stole it again. There was a black male review for Ladies Night at the nightclub. There was a black male review by suits in the offices, the courts and waiting rooms. There was a black male review in the weight rooms where the coaches licked their whistles. Reviews, once overs, half studies, misreads and nightmares looped the news. Your jokes and tears gained rubberneckers, eyeballers, ballers and money, Mississippi. The stares you got were crazy, it's true, but there never was a black male hysteria. American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. Probably twilight makes blackness dangerous darkness. Probably all our encounters are existential jambalaya, which is to say a nigga can survive. Something happened in Sanford, something happened in Ferguson and Brooklyn in Charleston, something happened in Chicago and Cleveland and Baltimore and happens almost everywhere in this country every day. Probably someone is prey in all of our encounters. You won't admit it. The names alive are like the names in graves. Probably twilight makes blackness darkness. And the gate, probably the dark blue skin of a black man matches the dark blue skin of his son the way one twilight matches another. American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. Probably ghosts 
are allergic to us. Our uproarious breathing and ruckus, our eruptions, our disregard for dust, small worlds unworld in the corners of our homes after death. Our warriors, weirdos, anti-heroes, our sirs, sires, our sires, sidewinders and whiners, winos and wonders become dust. I know a few of the dead. I remember my sister's last hurrah. I remember the horror of her head on a pillow. For a long time, the numbers were balanced, the, the number alive equal to the number in graves. After a very long time, the bones become dust again, and the dust after a long time becomes dirt, and the dirt becomes soil, and the soil becomes grain again. This bitter earth is a song clogging the mouth before it is swallowed or spat out. American sign for my past and future assassin. Maxine Waters, being of fire, being of sword shaped like a silver tongue, cauldron, siren, black as tarnation, black as the consciousness of a black president's wife, black as his black tie tuxedo beside his black wife in room after room of whiteness, my grandmother's name had water in it too, Watermaker. I have wept listening to Aretha Franklin sing Precious Lord. I have placed my thumb on the tongue of a black woman with an unbreakable voice. I love your mouth, floodgate, storm door. You are black as the gap in Baldwin's teeth. You are black as a Baldwin speech. I love how your blackness leaves them in the dark. I love how even your soundbite leaves a mark. American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. A brother versed in ideological and material swagger seeks dime ass, trill bitch, starved enough to hang, do ragged and smoke she can smell and therefore inhale and therefore feel. Must ride shotgun pouring fountains of bass upon the landscape. Must be fat assed fearless and God-fearing, an ancestral insurgent, clean as new money, a cryptographer, a storyteller, a glossy sleeve. There will be a jewelry of wooing. There will be stacks of folded longing. Amid twilight verbiage and parking lot smelling of live wire, liquor, hot air, and fire, accompany a brother. Shout outs to vixens and bitches out there twerking for fucks in Bluff Estates, Washington Park, Starlight, Shop Road, Joe Frazier, Harlem Street. This is daddy's boy who wanted. American Sonnet for my past and future assassin. But there never was a black male hysteria as if you weren't the spouse of Toni Morrison forced by love to watch her flower as well as literally expand. The locks of her hair prevented your skin from ever touching her skin. You never smelled the nape of her neck, though you glimpsed it when her head cocked to illuminate paper, as if everything was a tool or weapon. Often you offered your measure, but she preferred her own song as if to make your blackness more strange, more elaborate, more characteristic, fine-tuned and refined. Soaphead church, empire state, guitar, Gideon, son, the hysteria of being multiplied and divided in your lover's mind until you go out of your mind. American Sonnet for my past and future assassin. Probably all our encounters are existential jambalaya, which is to say, can a nigga survive? Would you rather have happiness or freedom, pain or boredom? Would you rather hitch your rotten rope to a wagon or hitch your rotten wagon to a leash? After blackness was invented, people began seeing ghosts. When my father told me I was one of God's chosen ones, he was only half bullshitting. Probably each twilight is as different as a father is from his son. Something happens everywhere in this country every day. Someone is praying, someone is praying. 
Probably blindness has a chewed heart in its belly or a gate opening upon another gate. I feel like we're getting here to the end. Let's see here. American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. Otherwise, home is the less made bare, the less made air, the addressless there less clear, where the wax in my left ear makes half of what's said unsaid. On the air, the mute news hounds ponder the tweets of a bullhorn, a rat in the cabinet beside the liquor. Anger is a form of heartbreak. Yes, it is. If you can give the world half of what Nina Simone gave it, you will have lived an exceptional life. All you have to say is, tomorrow you'll try to be better. Like a mother lovingly calling her son a son of a bitch. My lover never believed I held a gun in my mouth. So I talked to myself like a witness. I'd mutter, whatever, whatever, forever, otherwise. American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. My mother says I am beautiful inside and out, but my lover never believed it. My lover never believed I held her name in my mouth. My mother calls me her silver bullet, her mercy pill, the metal along her spine. I am my mother's bewildered shadow. My lover's bewildering shadow is mine. I have wept listening to a terrible, bewildering music break over and through and break down a black woman's voice. I talk to myself like her sister. Assassin, you are a mystery to me, I say to my reflection sometimes. You are beautiful because of your sadness, but you would be more beautiful without your fear. American Sonnet for my past and future assassin. A brother versed in spiritual calisthenics and cowboy quiet seeks funny, lonesome, speculative, or eyeglassed lass, shopaholics welcome, also prince fanatics, museum cashiers, and pragmatists conversant lipstick or no lipstick with the hipness substantial enough to contract around a muscle as well as expand around a child. Fear of boredom is ideal. Fear of dereliction is okay. Love for the Willie Nilly and Willie Nelson, welcome. Crushes, depressions, and unsightly hesitations are okay. Must freely expend humor and grace. Amid long Sundays, long drives, long movies, and school conferences, occasional acts of disregard or guardedness are okay. American Sonnet for my past and future assassin. But there never was a black male hysteria as if being called nigger never makes you disappear, as if the fear of other people never makes you levitate, as if the nuzzle of a bullet can't poke a hole in your breath, as if you cannot drink from the river when into the river you disappear and water floods the hole in your breath. You make shit, you piss, you calculate mistakes, you can turn stone into metal. You are able to breathe wind. Air touches your skin like medicine and you disappear. It's crazy. It's as if you are not being hunted by hysteria. It's as if your death is never death. You appear, you appear to disappear, you disappear. American sign for my past and future assassin. Overaged, overgrave, overlooked brother seeks adjoining variable female structure covered in chocolate, cinnamon, molasses, freckled, sandy, or sunset colored flesh, expressively motored by a blend of intellectual fat and muscle, while several complex and simple emotional frequencies pulse along her veins. Must be a careful and moderately self indulgent cinematographer, modestly self conscious reasonably self-important, spiritually self-educated, marginally self-destructive, must be willing to raise orchids or kids in the land of assassins, willing to wield a fluid expression in the war her lover wages against himself and a silver tongue in the war we wage against death. Okay, I think just, uh, these are the last two. 
All right, yeah, I'll, I'll try this one. I'll try this one. Uh, this means like it's like really two and a half. American Sonnet for my past and future assassin. I only intend to send word to my future self-perpetuation is a war against time travel is essentially the aim of any religion as blindness to color one sees underwater breath can be overshadowed in darkness. The benefits of blackness can seem radical black people in America are rarely compulsive high fivers believe the joy is a matter of touching others is forbidden. The only word God doesn't know you have to heal yourself to truly be heroic. You have to think once a day of killing your self awareness requires a touch of blindness and self importance is the only word God knows to be free is to live because only the dead are slaves. So this is it with the line breaks. American sonnet for my past and future assassin. I only intend to send word to my future. Self-perpetuation is a war against time. Travel is essentially the aim of any religion. Is blindness the color one sees underwater? Breath can be overshadowed in darkness. The benefits of blackness can seem radical. Black people in America are rarely compulsive. High fivers believe joy is a matter of touching others is forbidden the only word God doesn't know. You have to heal yourself to truly be heroic. You have to think once a day of killing yourself. Awareness requires a touch of blindness and self. Importance is the only word God knows. To be free is to live because only the dead are slaves. And this is the last one. American sonnet for my past and future assassin. I remember my sister's last hurrah. She joined all the black people I'm tired of losing. All the dead from parts of Florida, Ferguson, Brooklyn, Charleston, Cleveland, Chicago, Baltimore, wherever the names alive are like the names in graves. I am someone with a good memory and better imagination. Can we really be friends if we don't believe in the same things, assassin? Probably ghosts are allergic to us. Because we are dust, don't you and I share a loss? Don't we belong together, brother, sweetness, 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 poor, ragged heart, blind, savage heart? I've almost grown tired of talking to you. I'm gonna stop there, y'all. All right, all right, all right. <clears throat> so that worked out, I think, let me see. Yeah, I kind of almost made it seem like I knew what I was doing there at the end. Um, so that's all I was doing. I'm just trying to figure out how to read these things. But uh, anything y'all want to talk about for a little while here? As long as it's not a dumb question, that's all I ever say. You know? <laughs> I usually say, like, if I've done my job, there should be no questions. Kyle. What's up, Terrence? He's, he's a great poet. So the Eastern Seaboard. New Jersey's a great poet. That's Baraka. But, you too. I had a um, Baraka poem. I should have read that Baraka poem. Anyway, yeah. You still got time. What's up? What's up? So um, going back to what you were talking about with the chaos of the news, mm -hmm. I've been thinking a lot about anaphora and epistrophe and refrain as ways that people are coping with the onslaught of like sure. what we're getting every day. Um, and so you read the title of every sonnet, mm -hmm. um, even though we know at some point like what the title is going to be. Sure, right? sure. So I wonder if you could talk a bit about what was your relationship to repetition or how your relationship to repetition changed over the course of the book, because right, we have the repetition with the titles. We had the repetition of form with the sonnets, right? right? So at some point, like you had to be aware of that and thinking about it. So what was? Yeah, I thought like five different things just now while you were saying that to me. So let me choose one of those things to focus on for this answer. Um, you know, the writerly response, I guess, is I just needed 
to just not have to think about that because so much, I just needed to let everything kind of come in. So once I dispensed with thinking about titles, I just didn't know what I was going to do the next day. I was going to wake up. So like the Maxine Waters poem, I was trying to work. And I think I had the TV on, which I, I, everything I usually do, I just couldn't do in terms of my normal writing habits because that's the volume. So anyway, so she came on and I was like, oh, okay, so here's a, I think I wrote like two sonnets that day. I felt like that was a great day, you know, but the one for her came out pretty quickly, but I, I couldn't have known and I wasn't going to ask myself what was the relationship between that and the title that kept coming up. So essentially, you know, the way like there's a lot of Mondays in the year, but they're all different Mondays. So that's sort of how I thought they are the same, but they're really not like uh, they just happen to have the same title. But if you follow me, it's like a bunch of people named George. I was like George Foreman naming all his kids George. You know, they are different. I mean, every George Foreman is different, you know. <laughs> They seem like it's not. So if you follow me, I'm trying to say like on the one hand, it was just a way to kind of like just go all the way into the chaos. And uh, I mean, the side answer was me thinking the other day about like, you know, my lucky number is like 13. And I was like, that's so like me to just try to want to turn everything negative into a positive. You know what I mean? So I was thinking even with the title, like all of the problems with that, trying to see that as some kind of a way to be productive out of that as opposed to not as well as with just a new cycle. So anyway, so that was two, I think maybe three answers out of the five. Well, there you go. And that's it, I appreciate that red right new <laughs> Yes, sir, yes, sir. Um, I always have to say I'm, I'm not from the United States, I'm from the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So I am deeply touched by, I mean, the stuff you're talking about. Um, so this leads to a few questions. Sure. Um, the first question is that um, the poems touching on all type of micro and macro aggressions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, silencing and overlooking and demonization sure, and brutalization. Sure. Um, I wonder, after having done this, right, which is a lot of work, um, what is your hope for it? Do you believe that it can do anything in these times that sure, are continually sure. degenerating and breaking down and getting worse and worse? Uh, not only here, but I grew up in I grew up in the Netherlands, uh, in Europe, right? right? right, right. Uh, you know, the Netherlands that I grew up in is a completely different place at this point in time, right? Mm -hmm. You would not find, I mean, the racism and the discrimination, the xenophobia at this point in time is really starting to take on horrific uh, patterns. France, the same thing, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. So that's the first question. The second question would be... <laughs> I'm going to try to hold on to that one. I got like 12 answers to the first one. <laughs> you got to so. say, but that's okay. The See second what, one would be more, be obviously, more, obviously, as a... African American poet, uh, do you are there Caribbean poets, Caribbean writers, Caribbean intellectuals, uh, African intellectuals, and stuff like that? I mean, you're touching some people, sure, right? Sure. Uh, Baldwin and yeah, I mean, I can hear yeah, the echoes Walcott's of in here. He's Langston got a Hughes. Troublesome I mean, poem about Walcott is in this right, collection. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. So, so who would be the guys? Uh, I mean, Emile Césaire. I mean, uh, you know, and, and others, etc. Pedro Mir. From, so from, you know, can let me just go to that one really quickly for you. You know. Um, <laughs> The implication in naming a bunch of people right, would right. be suggest that the people that aren't named are. I'm always like, yeah, everybody, man, everybody you said, you know. I mean, I have to think about who I would put down or who, both yeah. like verbally, but also in terms of like my tendency, like so, Kamal Brathwaite. If we want to have a real conversation, right, right, you know, yeah, like I'm like, man, he's got some weird stuff in here. I would never do that. Therefore, I need to stick with it. So that would be again, that's the 13 thing. Like I just, I. Um, I have a really hard time thinking about like anybody that's devoted themselves to, you know, art, poetry, even bad people, like even people who, you know, like I, I go around and I meet people who are like 60 years old who still want to be poets and they're terrible poets. You know, maybe they were like lawyers or psychologists or something. And then they're like 75, I hope this ain't y'all. I'm sure y'all are great poets. And then they're like 75 and they're showing up at my readings and they're at my workshop and they're working super hard. And I'm like, that's enough, man. I'm with you, like tribe, even though you, you're terrible. <laughs> but because you're doing it, like how can I be like, get out of here? How dare you want to write bad poems? <laughs> so that's my attitude with most literature. Like I just, um, I'm usually trying to figure out how to like the stuff I don't like. So, okay, so uh, the first answer is, I mean, so when I'm reading to you and I say, oh, here's a poem where I was like, I'm just gonna read it, I'm gonna write a poem about what I'm trying to do. So I don't have to talk about what I'm trying to do. I mean, because I was writing every day and whatever was going to come was going to come. A lot of the, if that question occurred to me on a day that I was writing, it would be in the poem. So if it's not in the poems in this little batch, you know, called from all of them, um, 
maybe it wasn't like a super important question. So I say that to you because in the first poem, that is me thinking like the base question on that, the very first poem I read about Sylvia Plath and it, the line is in a minute, I'll tell you how little writing rescues. So I am suggesting something about like, can it really rescue us? And so for me as an artist, I say, could it rescue uh, Sylvia Plath or Biggie Smalls or John Berryman or Ernest Hemingway? Like these are all people like incredible talent and yet it didn't really save them. So there is a question for me, you know, going deep into the book around politics, around like one's own, you know, uh, demons or other people's demons, you know, racism, gender, family, all of that. So the question is always like, well, can writing, you know, can art really save us? How much evidence do we have? I think I believe in it. I think even a bad poet is in my tribe. So I'm going to do this as a response to the world. I mean, I don't know what it'll do. I don't know. I mean, y'all are here. I appreciate that. But I kind of would say, you know, man, I was just trying, you know, to keep from jumping out a window, really, you know, as we, you know, like the chaos that we're all feeling. This is just my response to it. Um, not much more than that, I guess. Yeah. Cool. See, two questions. We were good. Yes, sir. You mentioned your writerly habits. Mm -hmm. uh, you write every day. Um, just talk about your process and how you how you do what you do. All right. So, again, this would be a question that comes up a lot. Um, I do write every day because, again, I can't, you know, I don't really try not to be too judgmental with what I'm working on. So if that's the case, you can write every day, even if you're just writing your name every day that constitutes writing. So if your bar is that low, you will be pretty productive. And I try to keep my bar about that low. So, um, yeah, I write every day, but I don't think of that alone as any kind of real indication of you know, quality. Um, the difference between me and other people is that I know people will take my bad shit, like if, I, if I'm not careful with it. So like writing every day, there's always gonna be for everybody. It's gonna be a lot of bad poems. So even saying I had like 200, and then people are like, oh, where are those other poems at? And I'm like, eh, you know, I picked the best. There might be a few that I, you know, I stay on the fence with, but most of them like, you know, they weren't good. Just because I wrote a sonnet doesn't mean it was a good sonnet, you know? So, but that's writing every day. and. That's what I'm grateful for, to say like, yeah, you know, I wrote a lot of these things. Um, I try not to linger on the adjectives, good and bad, but so that's, that's my response. And that should be liberating to folks. Like you just can't really get too caught up on what you're making if you're just trying to get up and just write. So, but if you, if you, you know, gave yourself like 10, 15 minutes a day, I'm sure you could get somewhere. First minute or two, you'd just be writing your name, Terrence Hayes, Terrence Hayes, Terrence Hayes. And you'd be like, why am I called Terrence Hayes? So, you know, so I do think like, you know, duration just as a advice, I guess. Um, but for me, my bar is so low, I don't even like, I'm just like, yeah, you know, I, I do write every day, definitely. Don't ask me what I write. It can't even be that complicated. That's what I'm saying to you. Like, bar has to be like on the ground, essentially, you know, like revision, something else, like after you have written it. And if I go back to these poems, actually how I picked these poems for y'all tonight was thinking about like, certain ideas I sort of couldn't get right because I had made a rule for myself in this batch to not revise. Because again, what I was getting ready to go into is my normal spiel, even though the book is me even challenging that, is it doesn't matter if you write every day, but do you go back and try to re-see it? Do you try to make it better? Do you try to bring shape to it? That's really the question. Because writing every day, just sure. Do you see what I mean? But first word, best word, you know, I got an argument with Baraka about that. Like, I don't really go for that. Like, I believe in revision, you know? But in this one, to write so much, I had to say, no revision. Like if I get something wrong, I gotta try to write it again. So some of those lines, and I, I still would say, like I was on the fence even about the black male hysteria poems because they're not all good. Like obviously, if I had to keep going back to it, I didn't feel like I had got the poem right. You see what I'm saying? Like if I had gotten it right, it would have just been one poem. So, you know, I was like, should I still put those in there? And tonight I thought it would be fun to see like what would they sound like together, but I haven't tried that yet because I do see them as like sometimes I don't want to put them together because I think they're similarly with the other poems like the jambalaya stuff like that's me working stuff out so I was like well if I read them together you're just going to hear me fucking up a whole bunch <laughs> so I mean, maybe you did I don't know so anyway point is revision is really the question like it, yeah everybody should write every day write whatever you want write grocery lists and you know but then can you turn that grocery list into something there you go Good. I mean, I actually like this nice silence. I think we should uh, we should be trying to get ready to wind down here. Thank y'all. Um, I'll take I'll take one. Sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry, okay. sorry to spoil the mood. Are you trying here. to stretch it out? I don't um, mind. I'm not offended. I really I'm not. I'm, 
I'm gonna go sit down. Aside from silence, what were you uh, listening to while you uh, were writing this one? Because I loved going through how to be drawn and, and your other stuff and just s seeing in the writing like what what was going into it and mm -hmm. um, working its way into the very like form of the poems right. at the same time. And I was wondering the same thing for this one. I would say um, I'm usually, because if I'm usually writing at night, you know, doing everything else in the daytime, uh, I usually do curate like my music pretty good, but here in this situation, again, just so sometimes the radio was on and uh, some music. I mean, I was thinking about like, you know, I read one of those tonight. I read this one tonight, like when Kendrick Lamar's record came out and I was having a conversation with a friend who, um, and I just had the question like, what, what are white people saying when they're riding around listening to this Kendrick Lamar, you know? So then I'm like, okay, there's my poem. Let me see what I can work out in 14 lines. Um, so there's the music, but it still is more just a sort of in conversation with what's in the air. That's sort of how I felt. So any music that's referenced, that's probably what was on. So if I mentioned Gucci Mane and Lemonade, um, was I listening to Trinidad James that day? I think I was listening to something else, but somehow I got from him to him. So again, uh, I would say it's all there. Like, again, I'm gonna be very real with you. I mean, in the poem, I said I am, trying to make a record of my raptures. So really everything is there in the, uh, you know, yeah, it's there in the, if, it's, if Jimi Hendrix comes up, then that's probably, you know, what was going on. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. I don't know, can you hear me at all? Yeah, yeah, I think okay. I can. Uh -huh. So um, I'm here with my high school English teacher friend. We're uh -huh. both like doing the work with kids. Sure. And they always want to know the intention behind structure. Structure. Okay. Yeah, okay. Like this is oh, something we have to talk about, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. So if I give them this book of sonnets, they're going to want to know, did they all start as sonnets? Like, was that part of the plan or was that an editorial decision? Yeah, because that is that is the noun in the title. Like, I knew they had to be that, if anything else. And so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, cause, yeah, it was definitely first because it was all I had to go with was that title. I was going to go for four years. I was like, oh, I think he'll be in for Everybody was saying no. I was like, I think he'll be in for four years. This is how I'm going to deal with it. I mean, to me, that's what a poet would say. What else would a poet say as a response? You know, like, I'm going to blow something up. No, poets don't do that. Poets write poems. So I was like, four years. So I knew I thought four years of sonnets. That's, that's what I knew. The question would be like, what's the definition of a sonnet? And then maybe I was like, oh, if I say it's American, though, then I can do anything. <laughs> so, but I, Wanda Coleman had already called her poems American Sonnet. So I felt like that's what she was doing. So, I mean, it is all, it's all traceable. Uh, to somewhere, and there's some of that, some of that in the book too. I think does that answer the question? Like, is that like how to get kids excited kind of question or something? Like structure, because what I say about structure, and I, you know, I, I, when I say something smart, I say it all the time. Um, <laughs> it's like break dancing against yourself. One of yourselves is just break dancing, amazing break dancer, backflips, headspins, and the other one doing all the same stuff, but in a straight jacket. The person in the straight jacket, it's you, but in a straight jacket will win every time because it's just more impressive. Like break dancing in a straight jacket is going to be more impressive than break dancing not in a straight jacket. So it just, you know, it encourages creativity. It encourages thinking differently. So that's what structure does. That's what form does for you. Otherwise, you're just like swimming in the water. You know, you need a destination or something, you know, so something. <laughs> so there you go. Yes. Um, I'm sure you've been asked this a lot, um, and if you want to refer me to some interview or something, please do. But I'd love to hear um, about how you got to the point where you chose poetry to kind of mediate your world. Mm, oh, wow. Yeah, see, that's a big old question. Um, yeah, asked in various ways, but never in such a big old block. Um, I, I'm gonna try to work backwards and just say like, I, it's just um, generally creativity is, has been my, my strategy for dealing with stuff. Why that is, I don't know. I mean, I can't say, I mean, like, yeah, you could look up a biographical stuff. It certainly wouldn't have been like automatic in my family that creativity would be it. And then I would just stop there. Like uh, creativity as a response to the universe is my sort of starting, my starting place. And uh, language is it though. I mean, language is the, uh, the supreme supreme because everybody's got it like that's how i feel like we're different from just about every other artist like uh saxophone everybody can play a saxophone so you're going to have a leg up on a lot of people you know uh 
Sculpture, that's hard too. Music, you got to know how to read music. So there's things. But language, all you just got to do is talk. So therefore, if you are able to bring shape to this thing that's just everywhere, that's a really high bar. So that would be the great ambition as a poet, to try to shape this thing that we all share, which is to say shaping feeling and thinking. Um, but I do, I mean, I, I do love music. I, I think um, I've said, I say this a lot. Like I am just essentially trying to pretend that like um, I'm working with language the way musicians work with music. You know, like the re relationship is very, very close. And I do think it is. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess, I don't know. I'm trying to make it a really short answer for a really dense, without doing like a whole bunch of biography stuff. I would just say like, yeah, I, that's just a way to respond. I don't I get mad at people that don't respond to the world, but I, in the same kind of way, I mean, I think we probably do respond, you know, but for me it is like, oh, things are crazy. I need to sit down and like draw or uh, something crazy happened today. You know, I just need to get that, put some shape to that to make sense of it. So that gesture is just, uh, that's how I've always done it. So, I mean, lucky to still be doing it, I guess. Yes, sir. So, in one of your poems, you mentioned uh, James Earl Ray along with Dylan Roof. And um, there, the problem is that there's a growing body of evidence that, that suggests that it, James Earl Ray was not really the killer of Martin Luther King, it was mm -hmm. Frank Strasser of the Memphis Police. Sure, Department. sure. Uh, and it's fully embraced by every member of the King family. So I just wonder if that's something that you would revise or, or, or would you address this in the form of questioning false narratives? Yeah, interesting. I mean, so the first thing I thought was like, does Picasso's painting of Gertrude Stein look like Gertrude Stein? Because he's not all the way into cubism at that point, but he's, if you've seen it, it's pretty angular. So much so that, you know, you would look at that painting and be like, that's cool, but you might not automatically know it was Gertrude Stein, but you would be like, that's still cool though. The gesture of that, the gesture towards, you know, uh, so should I parse out like one? Okay, let me change this one thing. That's like saying um, the guy who, you said the guy who was there to drown Emmett Till was wearing sneakers, but actually he was wearing boots. And I would say, you're right, factually. But that goes back to the gesture of cubism, the gesture of elaboration, the gesture of metaphor. So that's I generally the area that I work in. It does, I do believe in the truth, probably more than I believe in facts. So maybe that's actually a good answer for that too. Um, but I, I, if you hear what I'm saying about the artistic gesture in that, like it's art. So are we really gonna critique how much Picasso's painting of Gertrude Stein looks like Gertrude Stein or are we gonna critique like brushstroke, color, composition, ingenuity, the ways that it looks like her, but it's not her. You follow me? Am I, am I clear? Y'all know what I'm saying? I mean, I can only speak in metaphor. I am a poet, but I hope you hear what I'm saying about that. Yeah. Cool. How are we doing? Are we good? Thank y'all. I appreciate y'all. Good audience.